Uh, my name is Ellen Holsey. I'm the Community Program Manager at Pierce Cedar Creek Institute. All right, so today we're going to talk about mysterious mushrooms. It's just a fun title, to be honest. Um, but I love mushrooms. To tell you a little bit about my background, uh, I actually did my PhD looking at a type of mushrooms, or uh, type of fungi called mycorrhizal fungi that associates a, with a lot of land plants. So it, this topic is very near and dear to my heart. Um, but to start us off this afternoon, uh, I do have a few true false questions for you. My first one, and let me move one thing. My first one is mushrooms are most plentiful in the spring. Do you think there are a lot more mushrooms in the spring than other times of year? If you do, feel free to type in true in the chat box. If you don't, feel free to type in false. What do you guys think? True or false? We've got a couple of falses, three falses. Anyone else who chooses to answer, feel free to put it in. All right, I got enough answers I think here. All right, so you guys are right, it's false. Mushrooms actually go th grow throughout the year in Michigan. Uh, well, some grow mainly in the spring or only in the spring, so like our morels, many more species actually grow in the fall. Uh, hence, National Mushroom Day is in the fall. All right, let's try another one. True or false? Fungi or mushrooms, and I'll tell you the difference between those in just a minute, are the largest living organism on Earth. What do you guys think? Do you think that's true or false? Oh, you guys are on top of things today. Awesome. Yes, I see a lot of truth. So it's actually true. I know I'm, I'm waiting this on what I asked, but the largest uh, organism on earth is actually a fungus. It's called a honey fungus or a honey mushroom. We'll talk a little bit more about that one later, but scientists estimate that it covers about 3.4 square miles. Uh, and this one would be actually in Oregon. So it's not a blue whale. It's not an African elephant. It's a mushroom, which is pretty cool. All right, let's do one more of these. True or false, mushrooms can make their own wind. This is a very unusual one, so who knows? What do you guys think? Do you think that's true or do you think that is false? Can mushrooms make their own wind? Hmm, it seems a little weird. Let's see, I see a couple of trues coming in. Any other like, people that want to choose? Hey, nice, true. All right, you seem to be all in agreement and you would all be correct. So scientists discovered a few years ago, about four years ago, we all know that uh, a lot of puffballs, for example, like to spew out their spores, spew out stuff, and it seems like they're making their own wind. But scientists discovered a few years ago that actually they can change the amount of uh, moisture in the air around them. So mushrooms are made out of a lot of water. So if you ever pick a mushroom, you'll notice they spit pretty spongy, quite a few of them. Uh, so they're, the consistency of them, just like the consistency of our body, is a lot of water. And so they can change the amount of water that's in the air around them, and that can change the currents of the air. So that air can take away its spores, uh, which is kind of like its seed-producing uh, materials. So kind of a cool concept. They, they seem to be a little bit more than we expect. All right, so let's get into it. So in Michigan, usually we think of mushroom, we think of morel. Uh, but a mushroom is basically, it's a fungus, and a fungus can include mushrooms, they can include mold, and they can also include yeast. So that whole category includes a lot of different things. And scientists estimate there's about 1.5 million fungal species worldwide. Actually, they think there's about 5.4 um, million species but they just, we haven't discovered them yet. And we are continually discovering new mushrooms, new fungi throughout the world. Um, they can live many different places, some that you might not expect. So they can live in the Arctic, they can obviously live in forests. They can actually live in lakes, which sounds a little weird, but there's been some research done on the Great Lakes where we have found new species uh, in the oceans as well as in deserts. So they can live in many different places and even on you, unfortunately. So they can live a lot of different places. For that reason, we have a lot of different species. However, this is a very important point. Mushrooms are not plants. The worst book in the world, in my opinion, there's a book called uh, Plants That Never Bloom. It's a good book, don't, be, don't get me wrong, but the title is so deceiving because this is a mushroom and it is not a plant. It came out in the 80s, so I'll, I'll give them a little bit. But yeah, not, mushrooms are definitely not plants. They have their own kingdom, so their own scientific kingdom of living things. 
separate from plants. Um, they may seem like they have parts of plants, so they do have something kind of like a stem. Um, they do have what they call the fruiting body, which is what we would consider the mushroom part, uh, just like a plant would have a fruit. Uh, they do have root-like structures, uh, which is called their mycelium. Um, which is made up of lots of different hyphae. Basically, they're straw-like structures, but they're not roots. They're more like straws than actual roots. So they may have a lot of characteristics that make us think they're a lot like plants, but they're not plants. Um, one really important difference between fungi and plants is that plants can make their own food. Most plants, unless you're a parasitic plant, plants can make their own food through a process called photosynthesis. So if you remember back, way back in school, that word photosynthesis, they take that light energy, carbon dioxide, uh, water, and they make their own sugars. Fungi cannot do that. They do not have the ability to do that. They need to get their food or their nutrients from their environment. So in that way, fungi are actually more similarly related to animals than they are to plants. So if you look at this diagram, the only thing to get out of it is, is that fungi are more closely related, related to animals. Plants are over here, okay? All right, so difference between a fungus and a mushroom. Sometimes I use those interchangeably. I probably shouldn't, uh, but fungi is the plural form for fungus. They don't have chlorophyll, so they can't photosynthesize. They can't make their own food. They don't have true roots. Remember, they have that hyphae and that mycelium that's underground. They don't produce their own food, and they reproduce via spores, not via seeds. So plants have seeds, fungi have spores. The mushroom part is the part that we see. So when you're in a forest or you're in a prairie um, and you see, for example, I see a puffball on the ground, that would be the mushroom part. That's that fruiting body, that's the above ground part. And the whole purpose of that is to make the spores, is to reproduce and make more mushrooms, more fungi. Um, and the, the spores is that reproductive unit. So it's kind of like a seed, except a seed usually has its own little lunch pail in with the seed its own little thing to get it started. Spores don't have that. Uh, so they don't have any food reserves. Um, and so you can kind of see they're really, really small a lot of times. If you've ever had brought in a mushroom and all of a sudden it ejected all of its spores, uh, they can make a mess. <laughs> um, they also can create health problems for us sometimes. But that's the difference between a fungus and a mushroom. Fungus has that overarching thing. It includes both the above and below ground stuff whereas the mushroom is just that above ground, just that part that has the spores. All right, so parts of a fungus, and this is really important for us to learn um, ahead of time before I get into nitty gritty, because these things are things that when you look into a book, when you try to go through and identify, um, you're gonna need to know some of these words, all right? So the first one is you have a cap. So when you're thinking of a traditional mushroom, um, you tend to have a cap. Now, all, all mushrooms have caps. We're going off of the traditional one right now. Then you have what they call a spores bearing surface, which is right underneath the cap, and that can be different. Um, we'll go over some of those differences in just a bit. From that surface come spores. That cap is attached to a stem, but that word could also be stipe or stalk, depending upon what reference you're looking at. So it could be called a stem, it could be called a stipe, it could be called a stalk all beginning with us, right? Um, all of that is made out of hyphae, and hyphae are basically just stringy parts. Um, and those stringy parts, they're kind of like little straws, all come together to make that mushroom, to make that fungus. And lots of the hyphae actually is a mycelium, which is that underground network of hyphae. So remember that big honey fungus that I was saying that was the largest organism in the world? A lot of that is underground is the mycelium, underground. You also can have an ulnus, or they call it a ring around the mushroom um, stem right here. And that's another characteristic to look for on some of them. The other thing to really be able to identify your mushroom, you really need to know what that spore bearing surface looks like. So a lot of times when you look at one, if you're looking underneath the cap, so if you can kind of see on my, your, my little picture here, under the cap, you're looking for different things. You may be looking for teeth, so kind of teeth like me, spines is another word for it. You may be looking for gills. So when you think of gills, think gills on a fish in a way. Um, and usually our mushrooms that we get in the grocery store, so our, our white button mushrooms will have those gills as well. You may be looking for pores. So kind of like the pores on your face, little holes uh, that 
mushrooms can have pores. You also might be looking for something called false gills. So false gills are a lot like gills. They look very similar to gills, but they're more like folds or wrinkles uh, or ridges is another way of putting it. And those are all ways to help you identify what you have. So for example, I had a person once say, oh, I think I have a great chicken of the woods. And I was like, oh, great. So we went out and looked and I looked at it and I'm like, this doesn't have pores. If it doesn't have pores, it's not a chicken of the woods, it had gills. Um, and so that's a really good identifying characteristic to what you have. All right. So there's actually two main groups of fungi. There's one group called the basidiomycetes, and this is what we think of typically as a mushroom. So it includes a lot of the gilled fungi or the gilled mushrooms, a lot of the boletes, a lot of the chanterelles. Uh, your puffballs are included in this group, um, as well as shelf fungi. So I've got a great shelf fungi here. Uh, so this would also be included on the boletes, okay? And then you have your acidiomycetes. So these are another type. They tend to have what little sacs almost. Uh, so these would include your morels. These would include your truffles, your cup fungi. Your penicillin is actually in this group. Uh, so they tend to have a cup more so. And what I mean by that is, remember I talked about, about those spores. Um, if you're a basidiomycete, those spores tend to come down from underneath that cap. Um, a little bit more, whereas your ascomycetes, you have a cup-like structure that those spores are in. Um, and so in those morels, for example, you know how you have those little indentations in the morels? That's where those spores are coming from. And so that's the major difference between those two. So when you're talking about the life cycle of a fungus, usually we see that mushroom part, but that's the last part before you get to the spores. Uh, the spores will come down, they'll go disperse, and they'll, they can disperse really far. They enlarge, they become the hyphae, so those underground structures, eventually a mycelial mat, uh, which is basically that, those other underground root-like structures. I'm not going to call them roots, but they're root-like structures. Uh, then you get a young mushroom forming, and then you can get the actual mushroom forming. And that young mushroom can actually form sometimes in an egg-like structure. Um, which is sometimes why you get these like little warty things on some of the mushrooms because that was left over from that egg-like structure underneath the ground. Um, and so this is just the life cycle. It's good to know it. Uh, the major parts of that life cycle that we'll be talking about today is more that above ground mushroom uh, or the fruiting body and a little bit we'll talk about that egg shape because some of our lookalikes have that egg shape. So. All right, so mushrooms are really important for lots of things. And I like to just bring this up just to appreciate mushrooms for just a second. Um, so there are recyclers in our forest. Without our mushrooms, without our fungi, we would have a lot of dead wood in the forest and nothing breaking them down other than some bacteria. Some bacteria will break them down too. But you have fungi and leaf litter. You have leaf litter, excuse me. You have some that's called white rot, brown rot. Fungi are really important for also breaking down oils and like oil spills. So oyster mushrooms are really good for that. Uh, fungi are also parasites on living material, so a lot of times we think of them as bad. Not all bad, obviously, but American chestnut blight, absolutely great for our chestnut trees. Penicillin, obviously, some diseases on us, mold. Uh, corn smut would be another one, as well as tar spot fungus on a lot of maple leaves. Um, so they can be parasites. Uh, one that I am really partial to is one called mycorrhizal fungi. Myco basically meaning uh, Fungus, rhizal meaning root. So 80 to 90% of all land plants actually have this relationship. And basically what is happening is that the water and nutrients, um, the fungi is helping to take up because it's cheaper to make those fungal roots than it is to make actual tree roots sometimes. Uh, so they're taking up that. And then uh, the tree is giving carbon or sugars back to the fungus. So it's a beneficial relationship usually. Um, and it also can help by helping trees exchange nutrients among trees, as well as helping trees communicate with each other. And I have another talk on this that I can give sometime later, um, but this is a whole different talk, so I'm not gonna go into that, but it is called the wood wide web. And uh, the wood wide web is very important uh, for that. Ah, dead man's fingers. Uh, we will talk about dead man's fingers in just a minute. All right, so, so I'm gonna hold off on your question for just a second, all right? All right. So fungi are also really important in food, and that's probably why you guys are here, uh, to talk about those edible and unedible mushrooms. So which of these foods do you think were made with fungi? Feel free to type it into the chat box. 
uh, if you want, um, but I will be going through this part just a little bit quicker. Do you think any of these foods are made by fungi? Hmm. All the pop for somebody. All right, so here's my trick to this. They actually all were made by. Um, so a lot of them, fungi are, make it possible for a lot of our foods uh, because of the processing. Sometimes there's no fungi in the final product of the food. Uh, so for example, in chocolate, uh, in the processing of chocolate, they actually use fungi. In the processing of soy sauce, um, but other ones, for example, uh, such as bread, such as beer, wine, that yeast is a fungus. Penicillin is a type of fungus that's in our blue cheese. Uh, and the soda, uh, it's actually, if it's citric acid, there's a, there's a fungus that's doing that. So um, all of them is the, the tricky part of that. All right, so mushroom hunting and foraging. Well, for good mu mushroom hunting, you want moist, humid conditions, which is why a lot of times the spring and the fall is a really good time of year to look for mushrooms. And you usually want to go out after a heavy rain. Um, you also want to consider the habitat that the mushrooms are in, uh, because depending upon where that mushroom is growing, that can help you identify it. So we've talked about a little bit about morels. Morels only come up in April and May. Um, and so if you think you see something that looks like a morel in September, probably not a morel. Uh, so something to think about. In the autumn is a great time. So right now is the best time to start looking for some of those mushrooms, September, late to late November. Once it gets really cold and not as wet, uh, it won't be such a good time. Uh, common Michigan mushrooms, this is just a fun fruiting chart to look at. You will be getting these slides, the important ones. I'll send you a link so you will have this information. So I know this slide can be a little overwhelming, but blue is the non-poisonous mushrooms, red is the poisonous ones. Uh, and you can just see by this box that I put around it, that would be the fall season. And quite a few mushrooms actually fruit during the fall season. Whereas the green box is the spring season, not as many in the spring season. You do get your some that do both the fall as well as the spring. You get some that are all throughout the fall, spring, summer, all year round. Um, you get some that are only the spring, but then you get quite a few more that are just in the fall or late summer. All right, so my golden rules of mushroom hunting. Before I ever talk to people anything about what is edible and what is not edible, I want to talk a little bit about what are some of the golden rules of it. So first, my first rule, please don't do this. Never eat a mushroom unless you are 100% sure it is safe. I like to say you can only eat a bad mushroom once, <laughs> all right? Um, so there are many lookalikes out there. So we know of the morel, there's some poisonous ones such as the beef steak that looks a little bit like the morel and can give you a lot of gastrointestinal problems. Uh, so there's a great cartoon. Are these mushrooms edible? Yes, but not more than once. And you don't want to have that uh, not more than once part. So just make sure you know for sure what you have. All right, our second golden rule. In North America, at this point, uh, you cannot get sick from touching mushrooms. Now, there are some poisons on the mushrooms. If you touch mushrooms and you're not sure what you're touching, you do wanna wash your hands after you touch them. But in North America, you're not gonna get sick from touching them, all right? However, if you go to China, if you go to Australia, there is a type of mushroom called the poison fire coral mushroom that actually, if you touch it, can cause inflammation and can make you sick. Um, so dermatitis a little bit. Uh, if you eat it, it'll cause organ failure, brain damage, et cetera. Um, but that's the only one that I've heard of, that if you touch it, it will cause you some problems. So just saying that. All right, third golden rule, never pick a mushroom without getting permission first. And also, if it's not on your property, obviously, and don't pick all of them, uh, leave some for other people. Uh, so I know on Institute grounds, for example, we're, we don't allow people to pick um, any plants or any, any fungi um, because we want to keep that out there for research purposes and for everyone to enjoy. Uh, so this is just a general rule of thumb when you're mushroom hunting. And then finally, watch out for poison ivy. Uh, it definitely likes to grow where the mushrooms grow. So if it's leaves of three, let it be. Uh, a friend of mine just took this picture oh, a couple of weeks ago. So this is a great edible mushroom and we'll go over in just a bit what it is, unless somebody wants to point it in the chat box. 
but I, I she put it up on Facebook. And I was like, oh, that looks great. And she's like, yeah, I was tempted to pick it, but I didn't because of hmm, poison ivy nearby. And those oils and that poison ivy can get into that mushroom and that might create a lot of problems. So definitely be aware of your surroundings. Uh, if you don't know this one, this is actually chicken of the woods. And we'll talk a little bit more about chicken of the woods in just a minute. Some other common mushroom myths is that all white mushrooms are safe to eat. Not true. Destroying Angel is a very um, deadly mushroom. It's also white, just like our white common button mushrooms. Um, another myth is that thoroughly cooking any mushroom renders it safe to eat. Not true. Poisons can persist even through cooking. Um, if an animal or insect can eat a type of mushroom, so can humans. Again, not true. Uh, sometimes their digestive system is different than ours. So mushrooms are roughly 50% inedible, but harmless. So 25% edible, but not tasty. So just because something's edible doesn't mean it's tasty. 20% inedible and will make you sick. Five or 4%, excuse me, edible and yummy. So that's only 4%. Mm. And 1% is inedible and will most likely kill you. All right, so just something to think about when we're thinking about eating our mushrooms. Um, I always get the question, but is it edible? Can I eat this thing? Well, so here's what I usually tell people. Just because it's edible, according to the majority of humans, it doesn't mean it's edible for everyone. Uh, so, for example, some people are gluten-free, so they can't have gluten, can't have the yummy breads and rolls and all that stuff. Um, other people can. So people have different tolerances to different things with, that they eat. So keep that into in that consideration. If you are trying something new that you do know is edible, try just a little bit because again, you don't know how your body's going to react. Also save some. Uh, sometimes even if you think you're 100% sure, you didn't catch something. So always save some just in case uh, you do have problems. Uh, I always suggest to cook wild mushrooms before eating them. Um, and most people suggest this as well. It just helps, um, it's got a lot of chitin in them. So, and chitin's hard for our bodies to digest. Uh, and so chitin's the same thing that is an in insect exo exoskeleton, excuse me. Uh, so it's better to cook mushrooms before eating them. And then finally, don't try it with alcohol. I know I'm being such a party pooper on this one. Um, but if you're trying something new, um, it's best to not try it with alcohol because it can affect your tolerance. Um, so those are just kind of my rules on that one. All right, so let's get into our mushroom forms. There are many, many mushroom forms out there. Uh, jelly fungus, stinkhorns, I think we talked about a little bit before, earth stars, morels, bird's nest, which is my favorite, one of my favorites, I should say one of. Uh, it looks like a little bird's nest. Uh, cup fungi, you might see that scarlet cap out there at this time of year. Coral and club fungi, as well as gills. These are just a smattering of them. There are many, many more out there. So to identify mushroom, you, mushrooms, you want to look at some identifying characteristics. You want to look at that cap. You want to look at the stem or the stipe, however you want to call it. You want to look at that ring around the stem. And so that's where um, the mushroom was being protected underground. Uh, it was protecting, usually it's gills underground. Uh, this is usually tends to be in more gilled mushrooms. And so it might have that little bit of a ring around it. And that would be a good identifying characteristics. The other thing is spore prints. Uh, so when it lets loose its spores, um, spore prints can come in many different colors. So as you can see here, it can be kind of grayish colors, more rusty brown, uh, lightish yellowish colors, it can be white. That's a really good identifying characteristic for mushrooms. Um, so when you aren't sure and you think you might have one, um, getting a spore print is always good. So you take basically the cap off the mushroom, you put it on a piece of paper, half black, half white. The reason you do that, if you do not know what color of spores you have coming out, if you have brown spores coming out and you put it on white paper, it's good. But if you have brown spores coming out and you put it on black, it's harder to see. So that's why you usually want to put it on half black, half white, if you have it. Um, the other thing is you do want to look beneath those caps. If you don't want to actually destroy the mushroom before doing so, you can use a mirror. You can use your, the camera on your smartphone or just your camera. So you can look underneath those caps uh, easily in other ways. So just some ideas. All right, so let's go through our first one, some gilled mushrooms. Uh, the gilled mushrooms, what I'm talking about here is I'm talking about they have the cap 
And underneath that cap, they do have those gills, um, kind of like gills on a fish. It's the most common type of mushrooms because there's thousands of species of these. They're literally found everywhere. Um, and when you're looking at them, you look at different attachment of the, the gills to the stem, so they could be free. Uh, they could come down a little bit onto the stem, those gills. And the ones I'll be talking about today, most of them come down a little bit or are free, all right? So they also, you could look at the spacing of the gills. These are some characteristics to look for for gills. They may have short gills. So short gills means the gills don't go all the way to the stem. Or they might have something called forked gills, which means they kind of look like a little fork at the end. Um, so again, they don't go all the way to the stem. They are forked at the end. Um, all right, so our first one. Honey mushrooms. Uh, so this was the one that had the largest organism in the world. When you're looking for honey mushrooms, you're looking for yellow brown caps. And those can get up to six inches wide. So they can get pretty big, uh, but they tend to be sticky when wet. That might be why they're called honey mushrooms. I'm actually not sure. Um, the gills actually do run down the cap. All right, so remember those gills are underneath the cap. They are attached a little bit to the stem and sometimes they run down the stem a little bit. And they do have those short gills. I'm gonna go back for just a second. So right here, you can see those short gills. So that's what you're looking for when you look at short gills. Um, there are a few different species that we have here in Michigan. Uh, you can see three of them right here. Uh, they tend to grow in dense clusters. So they tend to have like 50 of them in one cluster. Uh, the stems also tend to taper when they're joined at the base. And um, two important things. Most of them have a ring around the stem and you can kind of see that ring right here or right here. Um, there is one, this one right here in the corner, the tabescence, does not have a ring. So just because it doesn't have the ring doesn't exclude it, but they all do have that white spore print. Um, so you really want to look for that white spore print. This is when spore prints are really important. Uh, so the honey mushrooms tend to have a white spore print. So again, you're taking off that cap, you're putting it onto paper, you're letting it eject its spores onto paper so you know you actually have it. And they tend to be found on living and dead hardwood trees. So if you find this more on conifers in Michigan, they, there has not been any, any reported cases of them on conifers in Michigan. So by conifers, I mean pines, um, spruces, anything like that the lookalikes to our honey mushroom. Now remember, these guys have a white spore print. Um, and as I said, they are our humongous fungus. We actually had in Michigan what we considered the humongous fungus, was, which was a honey mushroom. However, a few years later, Oregon discovered a bigger one. But we do have a humongous fungus fest up in Crystal Falls, Michigan. So that's where it's located. Uh, but similar to honey mushrooms, so there's two different ones that are very similar to honey mushrooms. And you want to be really careful that you don't get these. Um, one would be, and I don't have a good common name for these, but the Phyllota species. So they tend to also grow in clusters on wood, just like honey mushrooms. They tend to, though, have a scaly stem and cap, but the most identifying characteristics on this is that their spore print tends to be dark brown. Remember, honeys have a white spore print. The other one that also tends to look a little bit like honey mushrooms, also tends to grow in clusters, can grow right beside the honeys. Uh-oh. Uh, they also have a thin ring, because remember, honey mushrooms do mostly have that ring. But they also have a brown spore print, just like the, the previous species I just talked about. Um, and their caps also tend to be a little bit smaller than the honeys, because the honeys can get from one to six inches. Um, but if they're growing, so look for that spore print. If you really want to try a honey mushroom, you want to look for that spore print. And if once you have figured out that that's the one that you have, that's when you can be sure. Um, so if you're looking at the spore prints, these are the two that you don't want to eat. They're going to have that brown spore print. The ones that are the honey mushrooms are going to have a white spore print. Uh, so that's a really defining characteristic between those. All right, let's go on to our next guild one that we're going to talk about today. This one's a little easier to identify. So most of you will probably know Shaggy Nane. Another name for it is Inky Cap. Uh, they tend to have more of a cylindrical or bell-shaped cap instead of coming out a lot more. And they also tend to have reddish-brown scales. And this is a really defining characteristic, uh, these little scales on it. Their gills tend to be really, really close together. 
Um, but the cool thing about this one is that the white cap actually turns into an inky gooey mess, hence the common name inky cap sometimes. And the spores kind of look almost ink-like when they're coming off. Um, I find these a lot of times in just grass, wood chips, really packed soils. So I saw this one, I think just last weekend in just a park, just randomly in the middle of a park. They can grow alone as well as in clusters. So something to think about. Um, but you will get a whole big cluster of these a lot of times. They do have a little ring down here too. But the cool thing about inky caps is that they are the great self-destructing fungus. You may see them for one second like this, but then they will be going going and gone. Um, and when you collect these, you want to eat them right away. You do not want to eat them on the inky gooey mess side. You want to eat them when they're more immature, so kind of like this. Um, you also, when you collect them, make sure you collect them in a paper bag. Um, if you collect them in a plastic bag, that plastic bag eventually will help it break down quicker, so you may not get to it before it becomes the gooey icky mess. Um, but they're a fun one to look for. Uh, there are some similar ones to these, so not as much when they're later in stages, but one is poisonous, it's called the false parasol, but these tend to have more scaly caps. Um, the others had some scales as well, but the one thing that is the difference is that the false parasol tends to have more greenish gills underneath, whereas the inky cap does not have greenish gills. So that's a really easy way to tell the difference. The scaly inky cap, again, oops, very similar. It's actually in the same genus as the previous one. Um, they also have a hollow stem that's white, it's scaly, grows in clusters as well. This one though tends to fruit more in spring and early summer, whereas the inky cap or shaggy mane will uh, fruit now. Um, and so that's a good difference to tell between the two. So fruiting time, very important, right? All right. Well, let me know if I'm going too fast for you, but we've got a lot that I still want to cover today. All right, so chanterelles. Uh, these are a fun one to find in the fall. So chanterelles, these are ones that actually have false gills instead of true gills. So this is a totally different category than the gilled mushrooms. Um, they tend to be more trumpet or vase-like shaped. Uh, but the false gills, basically, a good way to tell if you have false gills is they're more wrinkled or they're more like ridges. And for false gills, it's more like it's part of the actual mushroom. True gills, you could actually separate the gills from the cap pretty easily. So if you were to take it and you wanted to take off those gills and you can separate them really easily, it's probably true gills. But if they seem to be really part of that cap, most likely they're false gills. Um, at least in chanterelles, they tend to be forked. So remember forked, they tend to split a little bit and have some veins go between them. Uh, they also tend to start under the cap and go all the way down the stem. So that's another really important characteristic, at least for chanterelles. They go all the way down the stem. They don't really stop um, once they get to that stem or that stem. Oops, and I forgot to mention, uh, they also, at least the ones in Michigan, can smell fruity, a little bit like apricots, which is kind of fun. Uh, and they tend to be found near trees or in the forest a little bit more than some others. So in Michigan, we have yellows and reds. And in the yellow category, we tend to have pale yellow and yellow. I know, not very distinctive, right? Um, they tend to stain a rusty color when bruised. So that's a good identifying characteristic as well. The reds tend to be a little bit smaller than the yellows. Um, but again, they still have very similar characteristics. They're found growing singularly or in clumps. Um, but they do form that symbiotic relationship with trees. Uh, so remember that word mycorrhizal? Uh, so that's the word that they are forming, that relationship with trees where they're exchanging nutrients for sugars, uh, especially with oaks and beaches. So if you want to look for chanterelles, look around oaks and beaches. That's the great place to look for them. They also tend to prefer more well-drained soils, so on hillsides. Um, so if you find a lot of oaks and beaches on hills, look for your chanterelles there at this time of year. That would be my suggestion. The one that actually is the one that might look the most like chanterelles is the jack-o'-lantern. So this is actually a poisonous look-alike. Um, so jack-o'-lantern sounds very Halloween-y, right? And as we're approaching Halloween, it has similar colors. And so it's also an orange color, it's just like you get some of those orangish, reddish, um, yellows. But they tend to have more of a wavy lobed cap. 
Um, they also have those true gills. So they have true gills. So you should be able to pull off those gills a lot easier than you would for the chanterelles. Um, they also tend to grow in large clusters, whereas chanterelles tend to grow in much smaller clusters. Um, and so those are some of the characteristics to look for between those two. Well, the one cool thing about jack-o'-lanterns, though, is they are glow in the dark. Um, so there are a few different types of mushrooms out there that do glow in the dark, that do have bioluminescence. Um, there's basically about 75 fungal species that they estimate, some estimate about 80. But remember, if there's 1.5 million fungal species out there, it's not very many. Jack-o'-lantern's one of them. Maybe that's why they called it jack-o'-lantern. I'm not exactly sure. But honey mushrooms also glow in the dark. And honey mushrooms are edible, whereas jack-o'-lanterns are not edible and neither are bitter oysters. Um, and so just because they go in the dark doesn't mean they're not edible, uh, but that is a fun thing. So if you do see something that looks a little bit like a chanterelle, but not really, and it glows in the dark, probably a jack-o'-lantern, not a chanterelle. All right, shelf mushrooms. Uh, these are some favorites of mine. So sometimes they're called brackets, uh, sometimes they're called polypores. This is a really nice big one that I have here if you see my picture. Um, a lot of times they don't have a central stem. Um, they're more off to the edge. They look like little shelves or brackets on a tree. Uh, they tend to be a little tougher. This one is really, really tough and you can hear that. Um, but yeah, they definitely tend to be found more on trees or decaying logs. And there's a few in Michigan that are really edible and tasty. Uh, one you might see both in both the spring as well as the fall is called dryad saddle or pheasant back. Um, so these guys tend to have more of a fan shaped cap. Uh, they tend to be brown or yellowish on top with brown scales. Their stem tends to be black at the base and that's a really good defining characteristic. But these tend to be very squishy, kind of spongy almost. Um, they tend to prefer to grow in groups, so I've seen quite a few groups on them. Um, but I see these all over the place. They're really, really common. They're good, uh, wild edible, pretty easy to identify. I don't know of a lookalike for this one. Um, so this is one that's a much safer one to look for. As you can see, that's that fan shaped. It's got those scales. Sometimes it makes people think of it's a, the back of a pheasant, so the bird. Um, it makes me think of a little saddle sometimes, but this is a really good one to start off with if you're looking for mushrooms. And as I said, you tend to find it in both the spring as well as the fall. Another one that is a good one to look for is turkey tail. So turkey tail, uh, I've got a turkey tail here, it tends to be more velvety and much smaller than the dryad saddle. The dryad saddle gets a lot bigger. They tend to be more leathery and thin, um, a lot of overlapping, but you can see uh, there's a lot of color variation. It's uh, commonly called turkey, turkey tail because it kind of reminds people about the tail of a turkey. Um, but the important thing about the turkey tail is that it has little pores underneath. So remember, sometimes shell fungi is called a polypore. Well, those pores are important. If you turn something over that you think is a turkey tail and you see little pores, it's a very good chance that it is a turkey tail, all right? However, if you see something that looks like a turkey tail, this is another one that looks a little bit like a turkey tail and you turn it over and it does not have pores. It is smooth. It is most likely a false turkey tail. Totally different genus, will not hurt you. Turkey tail is one of those that I like to say it is edible, but not tasty. A lot of people use it in their teas. Um, this is false turkey tail shouldn't hurt you. Uh, there's no poisons in it or anything like that, but it just, not going to be as good as the turkey tail. People like to think that it has medicinal purposes. Mm, who knows on that one? There haven't been great studies, in my opinion, on that. Um, but that's kind of the difference on those two. So they will have sometimes green coloring on it, and that's just um, some algae growing on them. But as I said, going between the two again, there is quite a bit of color variation. And so velvety is what you're looking for, multicolor and pores underneath for the turkey tail. All right, chicken of the woods, woohoo! We get into chicken of the woods. Uh, it's also known as sulfur shell. So this is one of my favorites to find in the fall. Um, I think it's one of the most tasty. It's also one of the most easily identifiable. It has almost like a candy corn coloring on it. So it's got those oranges and yellow, yellows. It can get really, really big. So it can measure a whole bracket up to 24 inches wide. So it's like two feet wide. Uh, they're really spongy. 
So if you do collect these, you know how you like to clean things off under the sink by running them under water? You don't want to do that with these because they'll soak up all that water. You just want to brush off stuff. Um, and they're mainly found on hardwoods, mainly oaks. There's actually two different species we have here in Michigan. One tends to have more of a yellowish pore surface underneath, and they tend to be found more higher on the trees because these actually um, are what they call a heart rock fungus. And so they actually focus on more the innards of the tree. Whereas the other one tends to be more of a white pore surface underneath of them. And remember, they still need to have those pores underneath or it's not a chicken of the woods. But they tend to grow more at the base of the tree. They tend to grow on the roots. Uh, sometimes you may find them in the lawn or what seems like they're on the lawn, but they're actually feeding off the roots of the tree. Um, and so there's just two different types of chicken of the woods, commonly called chicken of the woods or sulfur shell. And there's really no good lookalikes on this one. So it's, it's a pretty easy one to identify. So we've got chicken of the woods. Then we go to hen of the woods. So somebody talked about this one being one of their favorites, also called mataki. Um, I apologize if I mispronounced that one. But it's another one that's more of a shelf fungus. Uh, it's more, it has those fans or spoon shaped caps. Um, these are very fleshy as well, soft fleshy. Uh, they also tend to have pores underneath, white pore surface, uh, and grow in more of a rosette pattern. So lots of fans coming out. Um, they also are just like that second um, chicken of the woods that I talked about, where they tend to be a butt rot or a root rot fungus. So they tend to be found at the base of the tree, mainly oak trees. There have been a lot of these coming out this season. I have seen pictures of people just harvesting tons and tons of hen of the woods. So this is another one that is um, very similar, very edible, um, just like chicken of the woods. However, on hen of the woods, there is a lookalike for hen of the woods. The lookalike is called black staining polypore. Not as fun as hen of the woods. Someone has suggested that maybe they should call this rooster of the woods instead of hen of the uh, instead of black staining polypore. Um, it is also edible, just like hen of the woods is. It tastes just a little different. Uh, it is also found on the bakes of oaks. Also, have, tends to have that fan or spoon shaped caps, but the caps uh, tend to be a little thicker than hen of the woods. So um, thicker, basically half an inch versus a quarter inch. The one major difference that you can tell the differences between these is that the black staining polypore, hence black staining, tends to have a little bit of black staining underneath the caps right here. Um, so that's basically the difference between the two. Not a lot of difference, obviously. Uh, they are both still edible. Um, it's just, uh, I've heard, it's Hen of the Woods is tastier. It's up to you on that one. All right, oysters is another one that is a wild edible here in Michigan. We have a few different species of oysters. I know someone who really likes their oysters, but on oysters, it is another shelf fungus, but this one, instead of having pores underneath, so it's not a polypore, it has gills, uh, kind of like those gilled mushrooms we talked about before, but remember, the, the stem on this one tends to be almost non-existent um, for, because it's a shelf fungus. Um, the pearl oyster in particular tends to have a whitish gray to lilac spore print, and that's important to know. Um, they tend to have thick flesh. Uh, they can occur singly or more commonly in clusters. Uh, sometimes those clusters can be on conifers, so those evergreen trees. The largest one tends to be about six inches wide, and these are the only ones that tend to grow in the fall in Michigan. So there are other oysters that we have here in Michigan, but those tend to grow in other seasons, not the fall. So if you're in the fall, very much into the fall, uh, so more September, October, most likely you're seeing a pearl oyster if you see an oyster mushroom. If you see other oyster mushrooms, you might see an aspen oyster or a lung oyster in other times of year. The aspen tends to fruit in more the spring and summer. Its spore print tends to be more of a buff color or a cream color, whereas the lung oyster tends to fruit more later summer, so August, um, and they're they have a similar spore print to the pearl oyster, so more that lilac color, purplish color. Um, but if you're looking in the fall, if you're looking at this time of year, most likely you're gonna find a pearl oyster. So. And my lookalike, so this is a lookalike. This is, it's called elm oyster. It's actually not an oyster, totally different genus name, not a true oyster in the sense that the gills stop at the base of the stem and they don't run all the way down. They also have a long stem. Oysters don't really have that long stem. Um, but it is edible. It just doesn't taste like an oyster mushroom. Uh, so there's your elm. It also tends to grow a lot on elms, hence the name elm oyster. Sometimes people say jack-o'-lanterns look a little bit like 
oyster mushrooms, but as we mentioned previously, they tend to be more confused with chanterelles, and oysters don't tend to be a bright orange color like, uh, like the jack-o'-lanterns are. So it's usually not con keep confused, but just to put that one out there. All right, we're gonna go over just two more. So we got our toothed mushroom form. So toothed means basically spines, either coming down or out a little bit. Um, and that's where the spores are coming from. So sometimes they call them teeth, and sometimes they call them spines. They look a little bit like icicles, I think, sometimes. You can find them underneath the cap, or you can find them where it doesn't really look like it has a cap. Um, and the ones that we find in the fall tend to be more like lion's mane, comb tooth, and beard's tooth. Um, they all are in the same genus, all are edible. Um, lion's mane is the choice edible. That's the one you really want to look for. And the lion's mane tends to have a single clump, lots of long spines, usually about two, two uh, inches long, whereas the comb tooth are much shorter, uh, more tightly packed combs. Um, but they tend to like oaks, maples, beeches again, a lot of those dead hardwoods, but they do get white with age, or yellow with age, so you want to get them when they're white. Uh, sometimes those can be confused with coral mushrooms, but I like to think of it as the teeth or tooth mushrooms, the spines grow down, whereas the coral, they tend to grow up more so. Uh, the coral tend to be more branch-like, kind of look like marine coral. We get a lot of these in the fall. I've seen yellow ones, I've seen white ones, I've seen purple ones, all at the Institute. Some of the corals are edible, but some are not, some are poisonous. I'm not gonna go much into corals today, but I do want you to be aware of them when you're looking uh, for tooth mushrooms. All right, someone asked about dead man's fingers. I believe it was Jackie. So dead man's fingers. So they tend to remind me of zombie fingers coming up from the ground. Uh, they are a club-shaped fungus, uh, usually with a blunt tip. They usually are found on hardwood stumps or logs, but they can look like they come out of the ground. Um, they do have a white flesh inside, and I think I have an example right here. Let's see if I bring that up. Uh, got nibbled on a little bit. In terms of edibility on this one, I've heard both things. I've heard it is edible. I've heard yeah, it's not really edible. It's pretty woody. So I would put it in the same category as turkey tail in the sense of it's not worth it. Um, but I have heard of people eating it. Um, I have not heard of any poisons in it, but it's a really fun one to find at this time of year, especially with Halloween coming up. So, all right, last one, puffballs. Uh, so puffballs are another fun one that people have talked about a little bit in the chat previously. So the big puffballs can get as large as a watermelon. They tend to be found on the ground or on wood, rotten wood. Um, you want to find them when they're solid white inside. That is the time when they are choice. That is the time when they would be edible, kind of like tofu color. Um, if they get to this uh, stage where they look all um, spory inside, puffy inside, don't, don't even mess with those. That would be like eating a dandelion fluff. It's not good. Uh, but puffballs, the giant puffball is the best one. I have seen these on yards. They look like white soccer balls. I have mistaken them for white soccer balls just resting on a yard. But they can be up to three feet across. So they can be pretty big. Uh, they're really good for eating. But as I said, they need to be white on the inside. You do not want to stem on them. They only have the, the hyphal network on, underground. And they tend to be in lawns, meadows, forests, lots of different places. Uh, they do make fairy rings, so those little rings that come around, that fairy ring is just that hyphal network underground connecting everything. Um, there are some lookalikes to puffballs, so when you do cut open that puffball, it is, if it is not white inside, if it's more of a dark purple or dark color, do not eat it. That would be a false puffball. It would be, uh, it would be poisonous. It would also have a tough skin. Um, some young destroying angels sometimes look like puffballs. So remember when we talked about the life cycle and that egg that can be underground? When you cut it open, it should look like it has the, the gills and the part of the mushroom just growing inside that egg. So again, when you think you have a puffball, cut it open. That's when you know if it is a puffball or not. Um, and these others are very, very poisonous. You do not want to mess with them. I actually heard on Facebook the other day of these guys, uh, a dog eating them and not surviving. So you really want to be careful on those. All right, so resources. We're going to quickly go through these. Uh, as I said, I'm going to give you this information. Um, I'll give it to you right now before I forget in the chat. This is a link to um, the resources. So it'll have my PowerPoint or a section of my PowerPoint. 
um, and it'll have all these resources as well. So I just like this one. What do you call a fungus that writes music? A decomposer. All right. So how can you learn more? Well, uh, mushroom growing kits are great to get just to help learn the life cycle of a mushroom. So a great place here in Michigan that actually grows them in Grand Rapids is called Michael Files Garden. Uh, if you type in michaelfile.org, they've got great kits, uh, all sorts of different types, so you can see what it looks like from the beginning to the end. Uh, right now, it's kind of hard to join a mushroom club, but Michigan Munch Mushroom Hunters is a good club to join. Um, just because with COVID right now, it's kind of hard to do that. But joining a mushroom club, finding some experienced people to really go out there with. I know we do hikes at the Institute. That's another way to do it. Um, you can visit a festival. A lot of the festivals we have here in Michigan tend to be in May, so hopefully by next May we can, and those tend to focus more on morels. But um, there's also some community science projects. Uh, What's in my backyard is where they're looking for soil, through soil for different types of mushrooms. Um, but there's lots of books out there. So I like to say the Bible of mushroom books is this guy. So Mushrooms Demystified is a very thick book. You can see it. It's a very, very thick book. This is if you really want to get into the taxonomy. If you're just kind of interested and just want to find out a little bit more, I would suggest Mushrooms of North America. So this second book right here. So because it's got great pictures in it, it's not going to have everything in it, but it's got some good descriptions and some good pictures. Um, whereas Mushrooms Demystified doesn't have very good pictures in my opinion. It doesn't have a lot of pictures in it. There's other good ones out there. Um, let's see. So National Audubon Society has some. If you're interested in books for kids or in more of the eating of the mushrooms, for eating the complete mushroom hunter's guide uh, is a good one. For kids, I'd recommend the Mushroom Fan Club. Uh, it's a great book for kids. Um, so those are kind of my favorites on that. Um, all right, so for the websites, mushroomexpert.com has some great stuff, good comprehensive materials. Um, Midwest American Mycological Information also has some good information, especially more Michigan-based, uh, especially looking at lookalikes versus uh, poisonous versus edible lookalikes. Um, that's a great website. And Mushroom Observer is also a good website. It's more citizen science-based, so you can put a picture in and people will look at it. Another citizen science-based one, uh, if you haven't been to any of our BioBlitzes before, uh, you may not know, but I really like the app uh, iNaturalist. So it's a free app. Basically, you download it onto your phone and it'll help you identify things. Uh, so if I was to download it on my phone, I just have to make an account, you email, username, password. Um, and then I basically just have to take a picture of something with it. So for example, I click on this little button that looks like a camera. I take a picture of this right here. I click next. Um, make sure when you do take a picture, you take a good picture. Uh, because if you don't take a good one, it might not know what you're trying to take a picture of and might misidentify things. Um, but once you take that picture, you can look and says, I'm pretty sure it's in this genus. It is. Um, and you can scroll down to about 10 different suggestions. And then it'll give you some more information. And you can say, yes, I think that is. Make sure you have your location services on or at least get to the location of where you are um, because your location is very important for identifying things. Um, then you can upload it. And the great thing is once you upload it, somebody's going to double check your work. When you look through books, nobody's double checking your work to know if you're right or wrong. But when you look through books, that's the way it is. On this app, the great thing is once you take a picture, it's going out to lots of other people. And they're gonna look at what you think it is and they're gonna say, yeah, I think that's right. And if they think that's right, they'll upgrade it to research grade. If they don't think it's right, they're gonna bounce it back to you and say, hmm, I think it's actually this. So that's the great thing about this app. Um, I actually made a project in this app for this class. So basically, if you go onto iNaturalist and you go into the community part uh, or into the projects part, excuse me, and you type in virtual BioBlitz mysterious mushrooms, you will find this project. Um, for me, the, and as I said, community projects, there it is. Um, it'll be under your projects. If you ever go out with that iNaturalist app, it'll automatically be put into the project. You can also join the project right up here, become a member. Um, and the good thing is, 
just keep taking pictures, keep looking at things. The only way for us to know things is if we go out there and actually explore. That's the best way to learn. So as I said, this app is one of my favorite ways to learn. You can join the, the project if you want. That project will be up for one week, so it starts today. It's up to next Friday. If you have any problems, just let me know. We had one from our last, last BioBliss. Our last BioBliss was all about golden rods. And that one, uh, let's see, the most observations for a person who actually took the class, so people who uh, don't take the class also can put in their observations. And 14 observations by Allison Hunter. Uh, she also got the most species, which was 13. And the most observed goldenrod species was tall goldenrod. And so we had 821 observations on our last file blitz, which was kind of cool. So I want to see if we can find more for mushrooms. Uh, let's see. So in, for, in conclusion, it's all in the eye of the beholder. So some people really like fungi and mushrooms, some not so much. Um, but one thing that I want to leave you with, advice from a mushroom, be down to earth, keep a low profile, know when to show up, start from the ground up and be a fun guy or a fun gal. All right, so these are my lists of all my different resources, some of the books I talked about, some of the websites, some other resources. Uh, there's a great bulletin from Don't Pick Your Poison, it's called from MSU Extension, some great YouTube videos. Uh, we also at the Institute made a mini field guide for mushrooms, so if you want to download that. Let's see if I answered Jackie's questions. Can dead man's fingers be more of an orange color instead of brown like in the photo? They tend to be um, brown, more brownish black. Um, Jackie, the orange would be a different type of fungus, that another type of club fungus, so in that same group. But dead man's fingers definitely tend to be more of that brownish black, so that's a great question. Um, the project name on iNaturalist, great question. The project name is, and I will go back to that slide just so you can see it again. Um, oops, there it is. So Virtual BioBlitz Mysterious Mushrooms is the name of the project. So if you join it, that way we can keep track of what's going on on it. Um, as I said, it's a great way to really learn about mushrooms. It's a great way to, to get out there. Um, let's see, we have another question in the chat. From a microscopic point of view, how much variation is there in spore shape and size? And is this used for identification purposes? Great question, David. So a lot of my PhD work was looking at spores and looking at them under a microscope. So there is quite a bit of variation. So you can get variation not only in color, you can get variation in shape of the spores. So circular versus more uh, elliptical. And that can tell you also shape of the spores, for example. That can tell you a lot about species. The problem is it's not as definitive as some other things. So a lot of these characteristics that we're looking at are very visual. Um, the reason why some of our mushroom books have changed over time and why I suggest things like iNaturalist and other resources that are more online is because the books can come out of date really quickly because of genetics. We're finding out a lot about our, our mushrooms uh, because we're doing genetic work to see, are these related? Are they not related? A lot of people are going away from identifying mushrooms via spores um, and going to more genetic stuff. Um, but yeah, they can be used for identification purposes. The size, the shape, uh, you do need a microscope in order to see the spores. And it's another good way of doing it because obviously we do not have access to the genetics that a lot of scientists do. So it is another way of looking at it. Color is one of the most common ways though, more than the size and shape. So great question, David. Uh, I think I found another. Uh, how do you normally prepare wild mushroom saute? Uh, that is a good question. It depends on the mushroom. Um, I do like to saute them. I like to put them in butter because well, I like my butter. Um, but there's some great books. As I said, the best book that I would pick up and you can probably get it at your local library. And let me stop sharing my screen for just a second so you can actually see this, is The Complete Mushroom Hunter. Uh, this one came out not many years ago. So it's a pretty recent book. Um, and this one actually has some great things where it'll have some lookalikes. So these are the russulas that I did not go over today and melt caps. So it'll go over edible mushrooms, some poisonous mushrooms. And in the back, if I remember correctly, it talks about bringing them home and harvesting them. Um, and so it has some great stuff in there, um, mushroom cultivation. And then here we go, some recipes. 
Um, and so I would check and see if you could find this book at your local library. I think it's a great book. Um, the author has also written some other uh, books that aren't as much into the edibility, more uh, books such as more guides as well. So it's a really good author. So that would be my recommendation. Um, but yeah, uh, I can talk about mushrooms for, for days. Uh, does anybody have any other questions? Oh, this is the other book that I'd recommend for younger kids. Um, this one's fun for, uh, just the pictures are fun. If you can see those pictures, they make them a little bit more approachable. Um, and they do talk about things like false morales. So, uh, so I've got a lot of books. Um, there, people are coming up with more and more books, but as I said, for beginners, I would recommend this one um, because it does have those great pictures in it um, that can help you. But I went over today, a lot of the mushrooms that I tried to go over today are ones that they do have some lookalikes, but things like Chicken of the Woods are really easy to identify. They're found right now and they don't have a lookalike, so that's great. Um, so yeah, I know, as I said, I went over quite a bit of information today, um, but as I said, you will get this, um, this video. You will get this video recording. I'll send it to you guys, hopefully, to by tomorrow. Uh, it depends how long it takes to render it. Um, and you will also, if you go to that website, rebrand.ly forward slash fall mushrooms, it'll have um, basically a lot of my slides that were important for today. So that is all i have for today i hope you had fun i had fun talking about mushrooms today i can't wait until we can get out there and i can show you these in real life i have so many specimens here here's my here's my dead man's fingers if you were interested in those dead man's fingers so um if there aren't any other questions um i think i'm gonna sign off but thank you guys for learning about mushrooms today and go celebrate national mushroom day so Thanks guys, bye.